and we lived to see another week of the Matt Sager podcast. I'm very happy to report I'm back. I've survived the infection, survived all the craziness of uh, the stuff I detailed in last week's mini-sode. I am Matt Sager, and I'm happy to say that my mouth looks normal. It's normal sexy self that uh, in the 80s got me ridiculed and in the 90s got me lots of love and affection and now has lots of strangers on the street asking, hey, who's your surgeon? You are fully plump-lipped. Look at you. It's the only compliment I really get, so I, I, I take it and I run with it. Yes, I've got uh, thick lips, full lips, but uh, no longer inflamed, engorged, swollen, or bleeding. Just regular lips now. Thank you, doctor. I, I won't say your name. I, uh, I, I agreed to get a lip biopsy. Actually, a biopsy of my salivary gland, and uh, it was a mistake. I asked about all the risks, and I explained all the stuff that was happening to me after the fact to the doctor, and uh, I just misplaced my trust. But uh, I lived to tell about it, and so, so I'm lucky. I count myself lucky. I did have a lot of time to rest. Boy, oh boy, did I rest and rewatch everything I've ever watched, every film, television show, and then I watched everything that's ever been posted to YouTube. I... <sighs> This is my first time out of bed since, really, July 31st when I got the biopsy. It's been a disaster, but uh, I'm getting better. My voice isn't back. It's it's 90 shock jock voice. Hey, brother man, brother man, I'm the man, you're the man. How can I be the man? You're the man, you're the man, I'm the man, you're the man. That's, uh, that's, that's as good as I can get, is uh, shock jock voice from the 90s, which is embarrassing. But uh, it's one step closer to normal. Speaking of, that's another thing I saw on YouTube is the uh, misadventures of uh, a sort of, ugh, that's weird. I'm only talking about it. I, I have no stake in it. I, I know very little about what's actually going on. I know a lot of people are, oh, all right. There's a guy who has a podcast on Westwood One. And so you probably know who I'm talking about. It's interesting to me mostly because of my experience with Westwood One. I worked there uh, first as an intern in college, and then right out of college, they hired me. They were one of, at, at any given time, from ages 18 to about 29, I had a minimum of two full-time jobs and one part-time job. I was a legitimate workaholic. It was my first biggest addiction, and that is the word for it. I was addicted. The truth is, my childhood was uh, horrible, unimaginable. Now that I know a little bit more about what childhoods can be, I, I think I've had the worst childhood at, out of anyone I've ever met, and I've, you know, I've, I've, I've met some people who are pretty damaged. So at age 18, through a series of goofy, dumb misadventures, I was able to... Uh, ingratiate myself to uh, Lindy Getz, a man who is not working in the biz anymore, but who at the time was the manager for the Red Hot Chili Peppers. And he let me come up to LA and spend a summer as the intern for the Red Hot Chili Peppers in, I want to say 92. It was the summer of Blood Sugar Sex Magic and them going on tour with Lollapalooza. So I believe it was 92. And it was amazing was the first real sense of joy and meaning that I had in my life. It was also a, a, a bit of a come down, you know, for all of us, our artists, our musicians, movie stars, TV stars, they can be sort of heroes to us. And we're all bad, I think, at naturally separating fact from fiction. I don't know if we're any better at it as a society or worse. I would venture to say probably worse now that we're living in this age of TMZ where there's just constant access to these artists and their image is so carefully massaged and everything is so overproduced and nothing can be aired without a million people on both sides of both parties signing uh, agreements, consenting to it. I think now you can control your image quite masterfully and that's part of why you can become famous for nothing because it's, it's just business. But uh, back then, I mean, the, the Chili Peppers in particular had a, a very specific kind of message 
uh, for that album in that time. And not everyone around and in the band necessarily lived that message, uh, quite to the contrary, and, and that was really sad. But also an important part of growing up, just like learning to be a really intense hard worker and learning that in a healthy way, the sweat of, of a day's hard work, knowing that you contributed to something that is going to make the world a better place, that instead of sitting around the way I did this past week, that you toiled and contributed to something, and you worked with people and made their lives better, and they worked with you, and it's just, I do still love work, just in a healthier way, and I've got a much healthier relationship to the many people of varying degrees of uh, success and fame. The truth is, pretty soon after the Chili Peppers, I became so jaded that I would meet, like, Kurt Cobain and be like, eh, what? Who are you? It, it was just, um, it, it was quite enervating and quite uh, jading in experience, but a wonderful experience nonetheless. And uh, again, led me to lots of other opportunities, including Westwood One. And working at Westwood One, especially at first as an intern, was so cool. It was a borderline magical experience being at Westwood One back then. Really, the people were so great. I worked with my friend Dia, who I also worked with at K-Rock. This guy, Andy Denmark, who I think is still doing a similar job at, I guess, a spinoff of Westwood One. It's, at some point, it split off into multiple companies, and part of it became owned by CBS and Viacom, and the rest of it spun off into something called United Stations, where it's still doing a lot of the stuff it was doing back in those days. And I think Andy is still basically doing that, and he was amazing at it, so I hope that's the case. Not sure where DA is, but everyone was so wonderful. And one of the people I worked with alongside them nearly every day was Don Pardo. How many people who work with their voice get to say or get to have had the memories of working with the legendary? Don Pardo was just an awesome guy. He was as kind-hearted as he was talented, if not more. Make of that what you will, because as a talent, he is legendary. And he would give sage advice based on seven decades in the industry. Just every five seconds, he'd give you a gem. Stuff that I use every day to think about myself personally and professionally and how I manage myself in the world with, with, I think, pretty minimal effort because this is just the kind of generous guy that he was. I don't think at any point he said to himself, oh, I'm going to take this Matt Sager under my wing or anything like that. I just think he was kind and warm and giving, and I was fortunate enough to be in his orbit. I honestly live by a lot of the stuff Don Pardo would tell me just off the cuff. Not just about voiceover, often not about voiceover, but stuff to do with radio and television and media in general, and about being a person and working with people. He, he, he was just the best of the best in every way. And, uh, A big focus of what Westwood One did back then, what I think Andy is probably still doing in some measure over at United Stations, were these sort of virtual junkets, where like, if you've ever listened to a radio show, to the extent local radio is still happening, and like you're in Chicago, and your morning show goes, all right, and we've got Bill Burr, or Jim Jeffries, or some other comic, and um, You might hear them have a sort of cordial conversation, but it might be a little weird, like they're not really in the room together, or like there's a bit of a funny delay, and one person is taking too long to answer, and his questions are maybe being stepped on. Sometimes a comic might say, yeah, I can't wait to be there in Buffalo, and the DJ will say, yes, well, actually, this is Nebraska, but we can't wait to have you either, and there'll be a sort of (laughs) awkward but uh, jovial and and quick resolution to it. It's because of these uh, syndicators and uh, junkets. The way it worked back then was pretty interesting, and at the same time, a little bit mechanical, a little bit... A bit oddly mundane, like a publicist would just bring in their clients who had stuff going on. A book to promote, an album out, a movie they're in, or just an anniversary of something they were doing. So like on a given day, trying to think, there was a day when our first guest who would come in, sit down in our studio, and I would connect them to first the morning show in Portland, then the morning show in Utica, then the morning show in uh, North Carolina, these weird virtual junkets. It would be like Scott Weiland, then Weiland would be done, and it would be time for Werner Klemperer. If you ever watched Hogan's Heroes, he was the guy who, I saw nothing, hear nothing. That guy was a gem. 
Then after that, it might be Alice Cooper. Then it might be someone representing the post office because they've got a new line of stamps coming out to commemorate the anniversary of the Apollo launch. And that would be a day. And it was uh, really, really fun as heck. So those junkets and things like them made up a bulk of what I did as an intern there. Uh, booking them, running the board for them, doing the patch connections. It was really, compared to the way things are today with me speaking into my iMac and doing everything digitally, it was comparatively pretty monolithic. You know, we were using patch cables, and I think ISDN was still a kind of exciting and really expensive deal for this giant corporation. You know, I've got one in my crappy little New York apartment that I'm getting rid of because it's obsolete. But again, different times. We didn't edit with Twisted Wave or Pro Tools or uh, Reaper or anything like that. We edited with grease pencils and reel-to-reel -reel tapes. And by gum, we liked it and we walked... No, no, it, it, it was fine. I like the analog era and I like the digital era. I'm a big fan of both. I'm just saying, it was a different time. We also shared the building with DC Comics and Mad Magazine, and that's really a big part of where and why I met a lot of my friends in the comics industry who are still tight with me to this day, and where I rekindled my love for comics, which was a big part of my otherwise sort of shitty childhood. Again, I, I, I don't want to go down a depressing road, but people have asked me, were you raised by wolves? And uh, the truth is actually a lot more depressing than had I been raised by actual wolves. When I went back to Westwood One, it was because Larry King had retired. I mean, obviously, he's still in the business, but he had quit his radio show. And they had decided to replace him with David Brenner, which is an interesting choice. And uh, it, it was certainly risky and bold and honestly very ill-advised, something that I, I wondered about at the time even as I was really happy about being back at Westwood One and really happy about working with David frickin' Brenner. I mean, that is, I know, it's a goof. He's, he's no longer with us, sadly. He was a wonderful guy, too. But I know that post-1980, he wasn't really a, a cultural force. But there's no denying what a huge, huge impact he had on comedy and pop culture prior to then. And honestly, at the time I thought, and in retrospect, I still believe that he was not well served by returning to the spotlight and certainly not in the form of a radio show. The only radio Brenner had done, to my knowledge, and the only reason he was particularly still in the public eye at that point, were his appearances on the Howard Stern Show. And Howard had a role for him, and Howard was a veteran broadcaster, and he knew how to bring in guests and assign them all roles that on the air might have played out pretty chaotically, but were actually structured in a certain way, and regardless, were entertaining and free-flowing and chaotic and no time for someone like David Brenner, who went from the stages doing stand-up to television, where he, and this was very weird at the time, so this, again, was 93, 94. The late night wars were in full swing, the, the first era of the late night wars. And Brenner, it was really sad. He had, to his claim at that point, he had guest hosted more episodes of The Tonight Show than Jay Leno had. And yet Leno got the show. Leno remained in the spotlight, despite them both being of a certain era and both being a little bit past their prime, a little bit outdated and a little bit corny. David Brenner had gotten a raw deal. There, there's no other way to put it. But radio was not his medium. And he jumped in feet first with a zero preparation and zero training. And I think that is, I found that more than anything, depressing. It was a depressing period. It was a depressing show. It was a depressing time in the life of this otherwise brilliant performer. And he was not supported well. It made no sense to me because, again, I was brought on when the decision was made. So Larry King had yet to step down. So I met with King's people and with King and with Brenner's people, who were basically the same set of people repping, at the time, the biggest names in comedy, the biggest names in television. He had the same representation as... I think John Stewart had, as Judd Apatow would later have a few years down the line. He was repped by the biggest names, and these meetings were very serious. So it seemed as if the foundation was being laid for a show that was going to be taken care of, shepherded, 
that there would be a structure of sorts, there'd be a support team of which I would be one, and Brenner would be given a shot to succeed. I'm certain no one said, let's bring in David Brenner so we can sabotage his career. But no one other than myself, apparently, unless everyone like me was too afraid to say anything, no one had the thought that, hmm, David Brenner is a big TV guy. How do we help him adapt to a very different medium? If that thought was ever held by anyone, it was kept very secretive, and uh, a discussion was never had, and plans were never made, and so David Brenner was thrown to the wolves. I remember those first few days of him panicking. He does sight gags. He is a television host. He had no preparation. Thankfully, he had guests. Without guests, it would have been just a train wreck. But he did have guests, and when guests weren't there, we would, ultimately, we brought in more people. As Brenner got more upset, and the ratings plummeted. This had been the Larry King show. Suddenly, people were turning on their same stations all over the country, expecting something similar. And even if it was him at his peak, and even if he'd really taken to the medium, they were getting David Brenner, who has a distinct voice, not necessarily of his many, many great traits, not really known for the voice. It was a bad state of affairs, a bad set of decisions made with the best of intentions, because when you hear David Brenner wants a job and you've got the opportunity to give it to him, of course you would say yes, but it, it was sad. Everything about it was sad. I couldn't wait to, to leave when the time came because it was just a, a heartbreaking experience to watch this great guy fail and, and to be a part of that post-mortem every day when the show ended. You know, what could I have done to make it better? Ultimately, the answer was nothing. The production team was small. We were not acquainted with one another. I was brought on before the guy I worked with was brought on, and uh, I was already entrenched. And we did not get along. We had wildly different visions of what could have helped the show. And he wouldn't, he wouldn't compromise. It was his way or the highway or David's way. And all of those ways failed. I like to think that had we been able to have a conversation about some sort of unified vision of what the show would be, that there might have been some hope for it. But as it was, it was the worst thing David Brenner could have done. He didn't need the money. He didn't need another credit, and he certainly didn't need to be going out at a late stage of his career with no support, looking dumb, largely not due to him, but rather due to a company. He'd never done a project before where people weren't ready for him, where people had no creative show set up for him to just step in and, and take over and, and interject his own unique style. Radio, you've got to, it's very different and he needed to have been, he needed to have that explained to him, and it never happened. Those were my last days of Westwood One, and they were marked by a sense of waste and regret and a hope that I would do better and that they would do better and that I, there would never be another show that seemed like a great idea, but obviously the moment the host is in the studio, it's a disaster. I thought those days were behind Westwood One. They're not. Oh, boy. So now I need to talk about this podcast. Westwood One has started a digital service. They hired a, another guy from my past, a, a really cool dude named Tim Sabian, who was my program director very briefly at K-Rock, at one point as an intern, at one point as another type of intern, at one point as an employee, and I think for like a day as an on-air personality. I could be wrong. He may never have actually air-checked me or, or been my PD again, other than as an intern or uh, employee. He did bring to the station his APD and one of the best people I've ever worked with in radio or anywhere else, one of the, my favorite people on earth, Andre Gardner. So he certainly has an eye for talent, not completely consistent, but um, he's got it. And um, years and years after my experiences at Westwood One and years and years after the last time I worked with Tim, Tim uh, came to Sirius XM. Again, after my time at Sirius XM, he came on, I think he was the program director for the Howard Stern channel, and after that, uh, did a very brief tenure as the program director for the Opie and Anthony channel, which I think at first it was called The Virus, then they changed it to Faction, and maybe Faction Talk. 
Sirius XM got very confusing and splintered, too. But Tim put in his time there and made some contacts, and I'm sure contributed a lot to both channels and to the company as a whole. And then uh, Westwood One brought him on last year as the head of digital distribution. I think in between, a after he left Sirius XM, I think he'd spent some time at Twitch, so that made a, a degree of sense. That, and of course his radio resume, which is decades and decades and decades of being this amazing program director. So hiring Tim for anything in radio, program director related, is a good idea. But his first show is called Opie Radio, and as the name would suggest, he brought in Opie, late of the late Opie and Anthony show, to host a podcast that is, oh, ha. Uh, you know, Seinfeld famously called itself a show about nothing. I was a fan of Seinfeld. Seinfeld was a tight 30 minutes with a cast of characters that didn't necessarily make sense together and plots that didn't necessarily seem like they were going to go anywhere. But uh, it kept you entertained. I don't know Opie. Uh, his real name is Greg Hughes. And I know that there's a lot of controversy surrounding him. I'm not really interested in that. I, I kind of... I, I care to the extent that I find it very sad that Opie and Anthony weren't allowed to flourish. I've come to really appreciate what raw talent they represented and what they could and should have been allowed to be. And they very nearly were the heir apparents to Howard Stern. But I think Howard and people who he worked with, people like my PD, Steve Kingston, felt such a need to maintain the status quo, such a, a comfort for power and, and such a hostility toward any potential. I'm tempted to use the word threat because Kingston and Stern and Mel Karmazin obviously felt threatened by it, but I'll never understand why they felt that way. They worked for the same company. It should have been everybody working together, but somehow everything became perceived as a threat. And so Opie and Anthony were, th the fact that you even know who they are is a miracle because they were really fought against and suppressed for a lot of their career by Howard and, and others. Ultimately, they pretty much imploded. There was one firing, first of Anthony Cumia, then a year later of Opie. And uh, it's just sad. It, mostly it's sad that had the natural order been allowed to take its course, there might be another great radio franchise on the horizon. I'm not trying to insult anyone who's out there, but there is not another Opie and Anthony show, another uh, Howard Stern show to be found. There is not a next generation of radio heroes, rock stars, and um, that's really depressing. I don't think that there will be, and that's a, a real shame. Anthony had already been doing digital stuff from his home, podcasts and video streams, long before SiriusXM actually fired him. So he had this place to land. I, I, I don't think he was expecting to make it a full-time professional career, but between his studio that he had and his very small staff and his gigantic savings, he was able to pull it together pretty quickly. For whatever reason, Opie didn't. I, I don't know that he couldn't have, but when he left SiriusXM, he started posting. You know how I was saying I was watching all these YouTube videos while I've been sick? I watched Opie's videos, and they're weird. I, I don't know how to describe he lives in New York City like me. I think he lives on the Upper East Side. And these shows, if that's the word for it, I wouldn't post these shows. First of all, from a content perspective, they're terrible. They're Opie with his iPhone and no other equipment, no microphone, just nothing at all to contribute to making a professional or even really enthusiastic amateur video, neither in terms of content or equipment. Just, just any bum on the street, except he wants you to understand he's not a bum. He's special. That is the theme I am picking up here. You know, I've complained about this in the past, about how being a New Yorker, you're kind of a zoo animal in exhibition. There's a ton of yokels walking around with their iPhones going, wow, look over here, there's a gap. Look over here, it's a Starbucks. Wow, I'm on a tour in New York. This is crazy. This guy's selling newspapers. And it's, there's nothing more boring to watch or more unpleasant to endure as a subject of a video. Opie 
was a major, major professional broadcaster. He's got decades of experience in radio. He's been on television multiple times throughout the decades. He, shortly before things came to a head for him at Sirius, he'd had his own channel named first for Opie and Anthony and then for him. So he's not some rube, I don't think. Again, I don't know him, but these videos, at best, they're him walking around, sometimes with a friend, usually not, singing or humming in this really, like, obnoxious way. He's a guy in his 50s, humming the, I think, almost 20-year-old song now. It was released in 2000, The White Stripes, Seven Nation Army, that I, I know that Opie and I did both work for CBS rock stations at the same time, and as great as a song as that is, Oh, I can't imagine having ever worked in radio and wanting to hear that. Oh, I can't even do it. You'll, you'll hear Opie do it in a moment. But why you would want to do that to relax you or, or give you pleasure or to add some sort of ambiance to your videos when it's just the most. It, to me, it just gives me PTSD of working in radio and having playlists where you play the exact same four songs every time, every air shift. That song would play at 8, 12 a.m. and then again at 1, 11 p.m. and then again at 4, 5 p.m. Radio programming is so robotic. In the same way, I won't walk around humming plush because it just makes me think of work. And also, it's old and uninteresting. And if you're posting videos, supposedly you're creating content and whether or not you're featuring yourself, Oh, it's just the worst. He doesn't appear on camera, but he does want people to react and go, wow, wow, that's a big rock star. That's Opie. And, you know, he, he's far more, he was far more successful than I ever became. But he's a radio guy. He really appears to be begging for people on some level and upset when they don't. For them to go, wow, you're that guy. You're, you're Opie. And it's painful. So he does exactly what I described. He goes, wow, what are you doing? Selling newspapers? You got newspapers. Wow, look at you. This guy's selling newspapers. And what's that in the fridge? Is that what? Hey, this guy's selling water. And then if it's snowing, it's, oh, hey, look, it's a snow day. I'm out in New York on a snow day. Look at that lady. She's covered with snow. Hey, buddy, look at that. Is that a, is that a parka? Yeah, you got a parka. There's a dog over there. The dog's covered with snow. That's a snow dog. It's not even that dynamic. This is pretty much Opie being Opie in one of these videos. The name of the video, it's on his YouTube channel, which also is called Opie Radio. NYC woman very upset for no good reason. So there's a woman biking in Central Park, and you can tell by the angle of the camera, Opie is standing in front of her with his iPhone out in that stance of, wow, wait till she sees it's me, Opie with a phone. This is going to be great. This is what happens as the woman passes him by. NYC woman upset for no good reason. Yeah, this fucking guy. Calls her a guy. What's wrong? I don't want you taking my tissues, you fucking asshole. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Rude and rude. Yeah. Nobody wants their picture taken when they're going about their business in New York City. We're not zoo animals. What is wrong with you? He's a resident. If people did that to him... I mean, apparently now he, he does appear to want the level of attention that maybe he would be okay with it. Most people are not. There's nothing entertaining about it. It's not fun to look at. It's not, it's really uncomfortable to watch. Most of these videos, he's able to get a lot of views for them. And they average like eight likes and 300 dislikes. That's not something I normally notice on YouTube. But again, this whole week has been a big YouTube rabbit hole for me. And I, it is striking that this is a professional broadcaster who, yeah, he's not currently employed. I mean, he wasn't employed when he made these videos. I always assumed he was posting them. I think the reason many people post YouTube videos like him is because you're trying to, to keep your name out there in a positive way to remind potential employers that you're out there and you're exciting and there's something that you've got to bring to the table that's sort of unique and interesting and worth the very high paychecks you've been able to command a, as a radio guy and, you know, not unpleasant, not sort of just aggressively pedestrian. They're really noteworthy for how noteworthy they're not. They're just 
you know, I almost said any dummy walking around with an iPhone makes videos like that. But the truth is, I see people walking around with iPhones all the time who are clearly amateurs, who have no interest in or history in broadcasting. They're just guys and girls. I was going to refer to them derogatorily as yokels. But they're visitors who take semi-interesting videos and they don't get in people's faces, really. I mean... It can be a little bit annoying, but they're not trying to create a confrontation in most cases. They're trying to play it off like they're a little smooth, and they're not from here. And these people who have never seen some of these sites before don't live here like Opie. They show less astonishment at everyday stuff like newspaper vendors and people walking their dogs and shoveling snow than Opie does. It's weird that he would be this middle-aged shock jock who's seen and done a lot and is suddenly like, oh my god, a fire hydrant. What? How does that work? Let's talk about it. It's a very odd, real retreat to like, how does the world work? I'm four years old. It's weird. And if they really are astonished by everything, to the degree that Opie is in some of these clips, they keep it to themselves. They don't really bother you to your face like this. I guess on some level, part of me wonders, maybe this is a attempt at rebranding. Like, hey, I'm the guy who asked the newspaper guy what it's like to sell newspapers because I got in trouble for doing my job the last time. Even though what he got in trouble for and ultimately fired for is, to my understanding, nothing to do with anything that happened on the air, but all about extracurricular bathroom nonsense. But again, involving a camera phone. And I would argue that whatever he's thinking making these clips, he should be exercising real caution when making videos with his phone. Because the last one did cost him his job, and several years before that, I remember an incident with Opie and Anthony, specifically with Opie, they used to do this thing here in New York when they would finish broadcasting their regular terrestrial radio show out of my old station, K-Rock. They'd do this thing, I think they called it the walkover, appropriately enough, as they walked over and they would broadcast this, uh, their walk with all of their equipment and crap. Uh, they had all these interns carrying their stuff for them. And they would walk, I think it was like two or three blocks from K-Rock to the then XM building. And Opie was filming one of these, and they had a bunch of guests with them, and this was right around the time of the Sirius XM merger, which was something that was really important for the existence of either company to continue. Both companies had a huge stake in the merger going through, and they had successfully fought off such foes as, like, the SEC, the government. Against all odds, they were on the verge of having this merger go through. And the one thing that just couldn't happen is some idiot DJ bringing awful press on the eve of the merger. And so, as this walkover happens, they bump into this guy, I think his name was Homeless Charlie. It was Homeless something. He was a homeless guy in New York City, which is about the saddest thing in the world, other than being homeless in California, Mumbai. Being, there's, there's nothing worse. And you've got to be really heartless to be mean to a homeless guy. But against all moral sense, against all common sense, against this looming merger during which you don't want to draw negative attention to Sirius XM, Opie made a video of himself and broadcast live on satellite radio where the merger was getting ready to happen. Him saying, hey, Charlie, how you doing? And Charlie going, oh, terribly. I'm homeless, but I do have a cake. And I'll be going, oh yeah, you got a cake? And stepping in and crushing the cake. Which is, again, I, I don't know the guy. I know that it's very easy to join the throngs of what he and, and others refer to as haters. I know he talks about it a lot. I think it's been awful for him, frankly the aftermath of the Opie and Anthony show, I do think that the fans split into camps and a lot of people have hated on him or have expressed real hate to him and he's taken it really personally. But he's not doing a lot to assuage it. I kind of got acquainted with him for the very first time in my sickbed and, ugh, I, I cannot say I'm a fan. And I'm puzzled that Westwood One would be and even more puzzled at the direction or lack thereof, they decided to go with him. But where have we heard this before? Seriously, I'm having such vivid David Brenner flashbacks. It's it, it's honestly freaking me out a little bit. This is from the same YouTube channel, because he put all of his stuff, like me, you dump all your stuff on YouTube. 
It's smart to do that, actually. It's how I fell down the Opie rabbit hole and came to sort of understand and dislike his whole career while recovering from a salivary gland infection this past week. But so he's got this upload on Opie Radio YouTube called Opie Radio Podcast Episode 12. It's actually misspelled Episode 12, Day Drinking the Divorce. And it's so awful, right out the gate, so bad. I will say that the podcast is marked by a, an astonishing lack of production. No editing. The episodes are like four hours long and no guests. Just Opie and his crew talking to each other and then going out in the open and talking to strangers like in his YouTube videos. And, and often going, isn't this great? This is so much funner than radio was. And it rings quite hollow. Certainly, I don't think it's more fun for the people listening, and I don't really think it's more fun for him. But the equipment he goes out with, it's this little crummy thing. You can get it on Amazon for $89.99. It's not professional equipment. It's not even close. But let's say that that were top-of-the-line professional thing for a, a big-name broadcaster producing the first digital product from Westwood One, this giant company with a legacy, and this is not a, a minor deal. This is baby toys, and he's got like six co-hosts and a hundred guests at a time because he goes out into the open and yells at everybody, hey, what are you doing? Hey, what are you doing? Hey, what are you doing? And they're all shouting into this microphone that you would get a nine-year-old. You would never put it out in the field, and you wouldn't put it in the middle of a hundred people where none of them are close enough that you can hear what anyone's... It, it's horrible. But rather than give them equipment, and then rather than editing these ponderous, just painful, they do these awful, corny, cheesy, lame radio bit intros. Listen to this painful Christopher Walken introduction that is the only piece of production you're going to hear on all of Opie Radio are these awful bits, and then he goes into this watered-down version, like a cover, offbeat kind of, of the Opie and Anthony theme that everyone remembers, and just like the show, it's all wrong. It's watered down, and it's a remind. It, it's only just a painful reminder of, oh yeah, no, I don't know what you think you're gonna get, but uh, listen. It's RC Cola. It's not the theme. It's not the show. It's not anything. But here's Christopher Walken. This somehow is worthy of opening. See if you're willing to even try the podcast after you've sat through this opening. Hello. Good morning. Good afternoon. Whatever time it is for you. It's me. I'm doing an induction. Me who? What if you don't get the reference? What if you don't care? It, it's already... 10 seconds in, I, I want to die. This is horrible. For my friend's podcast. Anywho, here we go. So, it's called Opie Radio oh. Podcast. Now I'm confused. Yeah, yeah, me too. Is it Opie Radio or Opie Radio Podcast? Is it Westwood One's first podcast? It's digital because there's no equipment? I, I'm confused. I'll, right there with you, Chris. Oh, 30 seconds. Damn thing. That's why you're listening now to number 12. The show hasn't started, and you're not listening to some fun bit. You're listening to this asshole drone on. Episode 12. Why? Why am I mentioning damn it? Episode. Why didn't he spell it correctly? Really no one cares. You listen to these things out of order. What is it? Chronologically OP? Right. It's a podcast. No one cares what episode. Granted, I do the same thing, but really, you know, he'll often go, don't forget, we're hanging out at the bar and grill on 79th Street. This is not live radio. No one gives a shit. You're not giving out bumper stickers. You don't have a booth. You're not there hosting an event. You're there as a member of the audience with your crummy microphone. Oh, man. And now, now the theme. The sideways theme. Yeah, everyone needs to know the location on your podcast, where we are. Why? You're not hosting an event. It's not we. If a bunch of people go there to meet Opie, it's just going to be a disruption. They're not hosting Opie Radio. Opie Radio is hanging out there because they don't have a studio. Beautiful place. You love it? Love it. Good chicken. Uh, Good fried chicken. 
Yeah, let me let me just yell and see if the mic picks me up, and then I'll try it again a little bit closer. Me and Vic, uh, this is our place. And the other day Let's not introduce ourselves. Let's not introduce any of our six co-hosts. We'll all just yell over each hey, other. Hey, Vic Kelly texts me, and he goes, I feel like I'm cheating on you. I'm at the, the ribbon without you having fried chicken. That's our meal, Vic. It's true. It was Thursday, and I still feel soiled. <laughs> oh, uh, 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 I, 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 I feel really... I know I just said a lot of crummy stuff about him, but I feel bad for Opie. He just wrapped up a 20-plus year career in broadcasting in which he should have been a contender. I agree with the rest of the world that he was not the most talented guy in his room, that he sort of was the Forrest Gump of finding people and putting them together on a show. And if you listen to the show, as I did this week, I'll grant you, I'm not some years-long fan. This is all based on a week condensed sitting in bed after I'd re-watched all my favorite movies and all my favorite TV shows. This was deep down the salivary gland infection rabbit hole that I discovered Opie at all. But it's pretty clear listening to five minutes of... I listened to one bit in particular. Heard it for the first time, and again, I, I don't have a great frame of reference for Opie and Anthony, but it seems to me that this if this is not one of their greatest bits, then they're really amazing, and they've got a ton of back catalog that I look forward to discovering. But it seems to me that this is probably one of their greatest bits. They discover a book by a woman who is a mistress of JFK, who was named Mimi Beardsley, which is hilarious on the face of it. But... <laughs> Jim Norton, the third Mike and now host of the morning show on what is now called Faction Talk with his co-host Sam Roberts, who also worked on the Opie show, and the both of them hate Opie, hate him. But these were better days not that long ago. I think it was 2013, and they're talking on this clip about Mimi Beardsley and getting an amazing amount of mileage off the name alone. But Jim Norton and Anthony Cumia begin riffing on the book, reading from it, inserting some phony lines into it, mixing those with the real lines, doing funny, goofy Boston accents, and imagining what Mimi's voice might have sounded like. And the chemistry is so electric. And the humor, you know, it's really rare that I get a real laugh on the radio. And when I do, it's usually deep and hearty because it's earned it's just so funny and this was just this moment of electricity where these guys are bouncing off of each other and the bits getting funnier and funnier and funnier and funnier for like 35 minutes i think opie says maybe two things the entire time in this non-stop back and forth conversation and i'm sure that from his point of view he was being boxed out but he ought to have been able to contribute they really tried there's a moment where he tries to be funny at their level, and it's sort of goofy. They're in the middle of so many now running and interspersed jokes on so many levels. You're just, you're buckled over laughing. You're, you're in pain from how much fun you're having. And Opie goes, <coughs> Camelot is bullshit. And they all kind of give him a courteous laugh, but he just killed the bit. They, they were able to go back into it. And then he speaks one more time, and it brings the conversation to a halt again. He goes, because they're goofing. They're, they're now deep into a joke about the premise that Marilyn was killed by the Kennedys, and if Mimi doesn't watch it, she'll meet the same fate. So the joke's been established. We're now having lots and lots of fun. And Opie goes, whoa, Marilyn was so killed by the Kennedys. And it's painful. Painful is the only word. And then... At some point soon after, in my case, this all happened in the course of one YouTube video some guy edited together, but at some point it was such a fan favorite that it inspired this musician who was working with Opie and Anthony at the time, a hip-hop guy or, or remixer called Drew Boogie, to do a song in which he just took Jim and I think a little bit of Anthony talking about Mimi Beardsley. And it was so, you know, their back and forth was really rhythmic and musical. And it was easy for him with just a little bit of auto-tune to do this really, really funny song. Not a parody, not a bit, but he just mixed Norton together. In many cases, not even cutting, taking whole big chunks of speech and mixing them next to other big chunks of speech. And it's this sort of hip-hop auto-tuned ballad to Mimi Beardsley doing grotesque stuff with to and on JFK. And I thought about it again when I listened to another clip from 2014 where they're talking about, this is now 
They haven't gone back to this Mimi Beardsley well. She's not a running gag. But they're doing like a news story and a phrase that is identical to one of the lines that is used in this song that Drew Boogie put together, one of Jim Norton's lines. It's the same set of words in the same order. You would never think about it except Opie starts singing the song. Over the news story, killing the vibe, killing the discourse, stepping over everyone in the room, and doing a callback to a bit that he didn't participate in. So, you know, my experience was really brief and really curated. So it would not be fair to judge Opie by that, certainly not by that alone, but it, a picture does start to coalesce, particularly when, when you hear the venom, just the universal. You know, it's one thing when people disagree, that happens often, but Opie, the host, the guy who founded the Opie and Anthony show, the guy for whom it's named, the guy who brought everyone together, who gave many people big opportunities, and yes, I'll be the first to tell you, radio is full of sharks, scumbags, backstabbers. But these seem like a mixed bag of largely decent people, and they all get along with each other. And they don't all work together. Many left the show. Anthony was fired from the show. It's not like they're all together in one place, united against Opie. And I don't think they're all friends on the same level as one another. I think some of them like one another quite a lot, others a bit. Others are just like brothers. And some have been with the show from day one, and some were late hires. Some are and aren't fan favorites. They have one unifying trait. They had a nasty fallout with Opie that he precipitated, and he's bad-mouthing them all over the place. And it, the picture doesn't look good, is my point. What I see here that really bums me out, more than makes me angry as a listener, what it really bums me out and, and gives me the Brenner flashbacks is not even equipment, not even guests, no format to speak of, no editing at all. And these pre-produced production pieces that are garbage. And then just him and a bunch of guys yelling over each other. I don't know. I, I hope Opie's enjoying it, but my impression is that it's just like Brenner. That after this career, in which again, however much you think he contributed to the show, he was a radio god. He was gonna be the guy. He almost was really competing with Howard Stern. He had a channel, first at XM, then at Sirius XM, named for him. And now this is sort of his late stage career thing, and it's this awful thing where you don't know if it's a radio show, you don't know if it's a podcast. It's a joke, but it's, it's actually not. He doesn't seem to know. His co-hosts don't seem to know. Many of them are very funny people, and much like with Brenner, the least talented ones are the most enthusiastic and the most gung-ho and excited to be there. And the ones who I've seen in comedy clubs and who I know to be really gifted people. If you listen to these episodes, there is a reticence there. There's an awkwardness. There's pauses. They're often asked to agree with him when he says something that's sort of dumb. And absent any comedy, it's very weird that he's doing a comedy show. And as a headliner, even though he's got as he did before, a crew with him. Since it's Opie Radio, he really dominates the conversation in many ways for the first time in decades on his own show. And in so doing, he reveals all this stuff he doesn't know. He talks about, oh, he, he misuses words constantly. He says it's a mute point. He says my algaes are acting up when he's got hay fever. And then someone yells a bad joke or someone walks into the room and everyone laughs. And periodically, no one will laugh because no one tells jokes. And he'll go, why isn't anyone laughing? And we'll go, oh, well, well, we, we're just letting you riff. We didn't want to get in your way. He even brought Tim, who was watching him at this bar event, and goes, hey, Tim, you haven't laughed once. And Tim has to go over and give him a pep talk. <sighs> I have no question that Tim, who I do know, is capable of better. I'm sure that Westwood One is better. I don't know Opie. I, I don't know that he can bring something different to the table. But if they're going to stick with him, and I think they should try. First of all, they ought to pull every episode until they give him mics. I know he's out in the field. That's fine. But everyone can be mic'd up, and you can have structure, and you can spend 30 minutes editing a show. It's not hard. You don't have to do it. You can hire a guy for criminally low rates. I've been that guy. It's easy to get done. 
it's not clear to me why they're not even trying, but it's honestly really sad. Despite everything I've just said negatively, I think this blows for Opie and I feel sorry for him. Other than the fact that he seems to be really enthused about it and talking about how much he loves it. But if I were him, and if I were Tim, I would think about a major restructuring. Something that should have been done in the, I think he was off the air 10 months, maybe a year or more, before the show before they cracked the mic for the first time, before they hired that band to cover the theme song, before they put any of the elements in place, if there's not a basic set of equipment in place, this is just a game. It's a goof. So start there. From there, some kind of a format. Opie's a broadcasting veteran. I know he knows how to put a show together. He is going way out of his way as he did in his YouTube videos, to not do that here. But to just say, look, in hour number one, we're going to be at the bar talking about some stuff. H have a general, have all your hosts in the room. Hosts walk in 40 minutes in, and they get really excited and stop their conversation and cheer and yelp and laugh. It it's not good. It's not good for anyone involved. And I know I don't speak for the listeners but my impression is it's not good for them. It's not good for me. I know I just started my own podcast after way too long a delay. And I know my last two episodes were me being sick, doing little eight-minute shows. And I'm not entirely better for this episode. I hope I sound better. I know I was able to at least put in a longer show. But I hope I'm giving you something you're enjoying more than Opie Radio. And I, I, I hope Opie and everyone involved, I wish them only the best, and that includes better content. And speaking of, I want this show to have better content in the form of co-hosts, guest hosts, going out to dopey events like apple picking or whatever the hell that was, day drinking, divorce. Uh, that's fine. I've got equipment I'll bring with me. I won't necessarily bring co-hosts, but I might. And I'd really like you to be one of them. Uh, I'm looking for co-hosts, voice actors, comedy writers, if you'd like to be a guest, if you've got stuff you want to plug. I live in Greenwich Village where there's billions of musicians and comics with stuff that they want to promote, and I love your art, and I'd love to help you promote it and have you in here with me, making this a more living, more vibrant kind of environment. Not, not totally Opie Radio level anarchy, but somewhere in the middle, a happy, a happy medium for us all. So join the show. Get involved. Uh, send me an email, matt at mattsager.com, M-A-T-T at M-A-T-T-S-A-G-E-R.com. Or in fact, give me a call. Call me at 646-535-4788 and follow me online. On Twitter, I'm Matt Sager. Instagram, Real Matt Sager. Facebook, The Matt Sager. And uh, my voiceover page is Matt Sager VO. And for blog posts, episodes of this podcast, my reels, contact information, more social profiles, and all things Matt Sager related, go to mattsagervoiceover.com. So with that, uh, I expect I'll be fully recovered by the next time we speak. And uh, I look forward to having a great week. And I hope you have one too. Till then, have a good one.